Great. Well, it's really, really wonderful to be here with you all today. Uh, what a gift to, to be able to join you, and, and thank you for the great work that you are doing. Um, just, just a real, a real treasure. I, I, I had the opportunity to be on Sarah Meets a few months ago, and I shared my family's deep roots with St. Unipera Sarah. I just wanted to share that all with you today. My wife and I were married 23 years ago, and we are married in the second mission that uh, St. Unipera Sarah ever uh, built. It's the Mission San Carlos in Monterey, California. Uh, it was the second mission he ever built, the first one in that area. My wife went to K through eight education at uh, San Carlos, the, the cathedral church and the, the cathedral school for Monterey. So we were married at that church. My in-laws, their parish is the parish where St. Unipera Sarah is buried to this day. Uh, that's their home parish. My mother-in-law has coordinated Eucharistic adoration at that parish for the last 20 years. Uh, so Sarah really runs deep in our hearts as a family. And I just thought I would share this little tidbit of the connection with Focus and Sarah in a really unique way. For those of you who are here on Thursday uh, for the board meeting uh, for Sarah, on Thursday afternoon at the Basilica uh, Carmel Mission where St. Nibro Sarah is buried, there is Eucharistic adoration with 25 focus missionaries uh, praying at the tomb of St. Sarah for a renewal of the Catholic faith in California. These 25 missionaries serve with focus at universities and colleges in California. And St. Nipper Sarah, of course, his love for souls, his zeal for the gospel is what made California, California. We know that today, unfortunately, uh, some of that is slipping away. So these missionaries wanted to go to where the founder of California is today to pray at his tomb and ask for his intercession for a renewal of the state of California, that, that those in California. So, so just, just beautiful. Uh, thank you again. We all know the, the tremendous impact of the priesthood and how significant it is in, in, uh, in the life of the church. It was said earlier, without, without priests, we don't have the church, we don't have salvation. So thank you for the work that you do and for following the, in the footsteps of, of Sarah and really fostering uh, the, the vocation of the priesthood. On, on the campuses where Focus serves, we serve on about 200 campuses around the country, and I'll share a little bit more about Focus in a few minutes. Uh, we've done statistical regression analysis. I can say it, I have no idea how it works, but we have a, a department that looks at the data uh, within Focus, and we've done regression analysis to figure out what makes campuses effective. You know, some of the campuses where Focus serves, there's thriving mission, and, it, and it's amazing. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students involved. And on other campuses, things are going great, but it's just not quite as effective. And we've looked at it to say, what is it? Is it, is it the priests? Is it the types of missionaries? Is it the campus makeup? You know, some campuses have uh, you know, uh, more of a suitcase college. Some campuses have a bigger residential population. What is it that makes a difference? And you know what the number one factor is? A priest who loves the gospel and is, makes himself available to the students. That is the number one factor that determines focuses effectiveness on campuses is whether we are working with a priest who is committed to the gospel and makes himself available to college students. So we, we, we know just the, 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 the dynamic impact of priests. So thank you for what you are doing to, to support that. So as I mentioned, uh, Focus is on about 200 campuses. Just out of curiosity, how many, how many of you support a Focus missionary? Fantastic. Thank you so much. A, a significant number of the room does that. Uh, thank you for your support of Focus missionaries. We obviously cannot do what we do without that support. What a, what a gift to have Hosman here today earlier to, to open our eyes. I think all of us know in some sense the situation. Matt, thank you for opening our eyes to, to the reality of the situation with, uh, with Latinos and Hispanics in the church. Hosman serves on an advisory board with Focus. We have a program called Focus 153. And it's named Focus, it's named 153 after the 153 fish that were caught uh, by St. Peter and the apostles in John chapter 21. So it's after the resurrection. Remember, it's this odd statement of Peter. It's after the resurrection. They've seen Jesus a few times, and Peter says, I'm going fishing. And I've always just thought, that's just such an interesting thing. Why is Peter going fishing? So they go fishing. They're fishing, and they can't catch anything, reminiscent of, of Peter's conversion uh, way back early in the Gospels. 
And then Jesus is on the shore, but they don't recognize him. And, and he tells them to throw the net off the side. And they throw the net off the side. And they catch a huge shoal of fish. And they drag it to shore. And we're told by John later that there are 153 fish in that catch. Why 153? You know, why did John specifically point out that little detail? Well, St. Jerome and many of the church fathers tell us that 153 was the number that, that uh, zoologists at the time, they weren't called zoologists, but zoologists at the time, that was a number of different species of fish. So it was representative of the entire species of fish, representative of the entire, all of humanity that the invitation to go fishing for humanity, for all the souls. So we named this, this outreach, it's really an ethnic outreach. Focus's mission is to make disciples of all nations, the Great Commission. Well, the nation state did not exist when Jesus gave that commission. That's a relatively recent, you know, something in, in, in humanity, the last 100, 150 years. The word nation in the Greek is ethnos. Go make disciples of all of humanity, all ethnos, all ethnicities. And Hosman serves on the board of Focus 153 to help us be more effective in bringing the gospel to all ethnos. So I'm so grateful to be able to follow in his footsteps and the great work that he is doing within the church. So a little bit more about Focus. So we were founded in 1998 at Benedictine College. In 22 years, we have grown from two missionaries to over 800. We have 800 full-time missionaries serving on college campuses. Uh, these are missionaries who raise 100% of the support, financial support they need in order to serve on campus. These are missionaries who choose to not date for the first year they're on campus. These are missionaries who are willing to serve wherever we ask them to go. You might be born in Texas, but you're serving in North Dakota. Th these are significant commitments that they're making. They put their college careers on hold. Uh, it, it's beautiful to see the, the commitments that, that these missionaries make, and we're, we're blessed to have a few actually alumni here today. I'll embarrass them. I'll, I'll ask them to stand up. We have three alumni and one alumni child. You guys want to stand up? <laughs> They're representative of thousands of former uh, alumni, former missionaries who now serve uh, in your communities. And Suzanne uh, was one of the very first focused missionaries. She, ser she served with us the first summer of 1999, our first training. And her son Joe, is that right, is with us today as well, 17. Suzanne, I have an 18-year-old son named Joe, so we'll talk later. Um, but we, we have about 800 full-time missionaries now serving on college campuses around the country. And uh, what I want to share with you a little bit today, I shared at the Sarah Meets back, I think it was in October, um, what, what we call the method modeled by the master. What we believe in Focus is that what we're doing on college campuses is not unique to Focus. We didn't invent it. We didn't develop it. It's something that we learned from Jesus himself. Now, we use American terms to, to define what the method modeled by the master is, but it's really just how Jesus lived. So the method modeled by the master is win, build, send. It's winning people over through friendship to a relationship with Christ, building them up and forming them in their faith, and then sending them to go do the same thing that we did with them. It's the way that the gospel has been proclaimed and taught uh, throughout the generations of the church. So I talked a little bit about the method modeled by the master back at Sarah Meets, and what I'd like to share with you today are the habits of a missionary disciple in order to live that method modeled by the master the habits of what we would call missionary discipleship. There's a lot of talk about this, this term missionary disciple. It comes from Pope Francis's writings where he says, you know, we talk about missionaries and we talked about disciples, but no more. Now we will talk about missionary disciples because everyone who is called by Christ to be a disciple is also commissioned to be a missionary. So this missionary disciple said, but what exactly is missionary discipleship? What does that mean? And, and there's, there's a whole spectrum, and I think the church is still kind of trying to figure out exactly what that is. I would like to share with you today how Focus tries to live missionary discipleship, because I think it's applicable to everybody in the church. What we're doing is not uniquely special. We just believe it's trying to follow Jesus and how he lived. So I'm going to share with you these habits on how we try to live 
missionary discipleship. So habit number one is divine intimacy. Divine intimacy. I think it could be argued that Vatican II, the Council of Vatican II, the primary thread running throughout the Council and the, the, the pinnacle of the Council is the universal call to holiness. That every baptized man, woman, and child is called to holiness. And quite frankly, every non-baptized is called as well. We're all called not just to be little S saints, but to live a life that could actually be canonized. We're called to this intimacy with Christ. So you've heard it, throughout, sounds like throughout this weekend, hopefully we'll all hear it because we all need to hear it over and over again. That missionary discipleship starts with our own surrender to God's love. In John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Christ, he's just celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. He's about to go give his life for the salvation of the world. And he's praying his high priestly prayer. And as he's praying, he says this in verse 3 of chapter 17. Father, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Father, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's the only place in the Gospels where Jesus defines eternal life. And eternal life is not something we wait for up in heaven. Eternal life is relationship with the triune God. As Father said earlier during the Holy Hour today, God the Father is perfect goodness, perfect love, everything perfect, and he pours everything that he has out. And that gift of love is so real that it is the Son. And the Son receives that gift from the Father. God from God, light from light, everything good, and he pours it back out to the Father. And the love between the Father and the Son is so real and perfect that it is the Holy Spirit. As the Catechism tells us, God is an eternal exchange of love, an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are invited to participate in that exchange. We are invited to participate in the eternal exchange of love that is God himself. That's amazing. It's amazing that we are called and invited into that. So eternal life is knowing the love of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we talk about this word know, we think of it kind of like in an American sense, in an intellectual sense, that we know that two plus two equals four, or we know that Dallas is in the state of Texas. But the know that Jesus is speaking of when he says that eternal life is knowing God the Father, that's a biblical knowledge. It's a biblical knowledge. It's not knowing two plus two plus equals four. It's the know that we read about in Genesis when it says that Adam knew Eve and together they conceived a son. This knowledge is deep, intimate, covenantal, life-giving, lifelong knowledge. It's the love between a husband and a wife. And the love between a husband and a wife that is so real and so complete that when they give of themselves, a child comes from it. That's an image, in fact, a weak image, but it is an image that God gives us of the love that we are supposed to have with God himself. The intimacy of the marital exchange between husband and wife is an image of the love that we are called to with God. That's intimacy. That's divine intimacy. And so everything begins with divine intimacy. I grew up in an amazing Catholic family. I'm so, so grateful. My parents have been married over 50 years. Uh, they had five children. I'm the middle of five. And um, four out of the five of us are still practicing Catholics, and the one who's not is a practicing evangelical. That statistically is basically impossible in today's world. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the middle, I'm 49, that all of my siblings are faithful Christians raising faithful families is amazing, and I'm so, so grateful for it. My parents have 24 grandchildren. Um, we have a very, very tight family. But when I went to college, I was the lone person. I like to tell uh, young people, even though they don't know who Rambo is, those of you who would remember who Rambo is, when Rambo fights against the world, in the movie, he wins. In the world, in reality, he dies. You can't fight against the culture all by yourself. 
And so when I went off to college, I, I wanted to, to you know, be a good Catholic kid and live my life. And I did that for about six months. And I was lonely and had no friends. And it was too difficult, so I just gave up. If you can't beat them, join them. And so I spent about five years away from the Lord and lived everything that the, that the world had to offer. I partook of all the pleasures of the world. And for a while, you know, it, it, there's a temporal kind of like pleasure and happiness. But eventually there's a growing recognition that there has to be something deeper. I dropped out of college, was totally confused, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Eventually I moved to the University of Washington in Seattle to complete my degree up in Seattle. And in Seattle of all places is where God met me. That's where he encountered me and where I encountered him. I started dating my now wife, Barbara, and after dating about three months, uh, we were sitting down together after a conversation, and she turned to me and she said, you know, John, if we ever get married, we're not going to use contraception. It's a very interesting conversation, sweetheart. <laughs> Let me explain something to you. We are going to use contraception if we get married. And she looked at me and she said, no, we're not. And I laughed again and said, yes, we are. And she looked at me without a laugh and a smile on her face and said, no, we're not. And I realized, uh-oh, <laughs> i got to figure this out. I've got to convince this girl who I, I'm pretty sure I'm called to marry that she's wrong about this whole contraception issue. And so I started diving deep into research. And, and lo and behold, after nine months, realized that the church was right and I was wrong. That's the only time I've ever been wrong in my life. But I realized it then, and so then I, I just fell in love with the teachings of the church and started reading everything I could get my hands on and read all the people that all of us know today. This is, you know, Scott Hahn and Patrick Madrid before the internet, you know, and I actually went into bookstores and bought books and read them and had this really profound intellectual conversion. But I don't actually consider that my conversion. My conversion happened in the fall of 1997, October of 1997, when my wife dragged me, my girlfriend at the time, dragged me to a conference not unlike this one. And in, on Saturday evening, we experienced Eucharistic adoration. And the priest, just like we had today, the priest held up this gold thing that I didn't know what it was and put inside the Eucharist. And he told the story of the woman hemorrhaging in Mark chapter 5. This woman who has been hemorrhaging and has been sick, and not only has been sick, but she spent all of her money trying to get better, and the doctors only made it worse. And she is, she's in this town, and Jesus walks through it. And she thinks to herself, if I just touch the cloak of Christ, I will be healed. And so she works her way through the crowd and reaches out and touches the cloak of Christ. And we know the story, she is healed. So this priest holds up the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle and he says, or in the, in the monstrance, and he says, in the same way that Jesus Christ healed that woman 2,000 years ago, he is here today and you can reach out and touch the cloak of Christ and be healed. And all this intellectual knowledge that I had I could take you through John chapter 6 and explain to you why Jesus is pleasant, present in the Blessed Sacrament became real and personal because it was no longer an intellectual argument. It was a person who loved me and wanted to reach out and heal me. And so he starts processing around this conference room. There's about 500 people there. And people are falling on their knees and they're crying. And as the Eucharist is approaching me, I have a decision to make. Am I going to fall down on my knees and give myself to him, or am I going to keep living this removed life? And so in October of 1997, I got down on my knees and gave my life to Christ. And he changed everything in my life. Everything changed. I was working for a software company at the time, and it was a great, great job and great company, but God started putting a, a desire in my heart to do something different, to do something more. And about a year later, my wife and I got married, and about two months after that, my wife and I joined Focus. And we've been with Focus now for 23 years. And that never would have happened had I not encountered Jesus Christ. It's the encounter with Christ that gives everything. You know, Focus is not a vocation organization. I'll share a little bit later that we've been really, really blessed by God with many vocations. But the vocations, as Hossman said, and as you all know, 
Yes, we need to pray for vocations. We need to create a culture of vocations. But that culture of vocations needs to start with a culture of encounter. Of encountering Jesus Christ. When we, when we create a culture where young people surrender themselves to, to God and his lordship, vocations will come. Because when I say to Jesus, I give you my life, I surrender it all to you, then now my heart is open if he calls me to something crazy like the priesthood or something crazy like religious life. It needs to start with the encounter. And so our first habit, divine intimacy. The second habit, authentic friendship. And Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 8, he says to these Christians who he spent some time with, having so fond an affection for you, we are ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives, because you'd become so dear to us. Not only the gospel of God. I mean, that's kind of a crazy statement for Paul to say, we shared with you not only the gospel of God, what, what else is there? He said, but we shared with you our very lives. The gospel has always been shared. Yes, it can be preached from the rooftops, and we need to do that. We need to use modern media. But the primary way the gospel has been shared is person to person. Throughout humanity, it is person to person. A friend saying, let me introduce you to my friend. And it's in the context of authentic friendship that we share the gospel within focus. Yes, many of you know about and maybe even have attended our conferences like SEEK. And they're amazing. You know, tens of thousands of young people coming to deepen their relationship with Christ. But we use the conference as an opportunity to strengthen the friendships that exist. Because it's within the context of the friendship that the gospel is shared. I mean, think just of the apostles. I love looking at Peter's life and Peter's conversion moments throughout the scriptures. In Luke chapter 5, and it's also reflected in Mark and Matthew's gospel, Peter has his drop the nets moment. It's the moment where he's out, you know, he's fishing all night and catches nothing, and then he comes back in, and he's mending his nets, and Jesus comes and says, hey, will you take me out so I can preach? And Peter says, okay, and they, they go out, and, and, and Jesus preaches, and then after he's done, he turns to Peter and he says, put out into the deep for a catch. And Peter says, what are you talking, I'm a professional fisherman, I know what I'm doing, I fished all night, I just got done cleaning my nets, now you want me to go out? And Jesus says, put out into the deep, and you can imagine, like, Peter, I'm, I try to imagine what he must have been like, was he rolling his eyes when he said, master, we fished all night and toiled, caught nothing, but at your word, or is, or is he, you know, what, what is his countenance like? And then, of course, he has this great catch of fish. The other boat needs to come over. And then afterwards, Peter turns to Jesus and says, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus says, Come, follow me. From now on, you'll be catching men. What an amazing moment. What we don't realize all the time is that that was not Jesus' first encounter with Peter. Yes, it was a miraculous catch of fish. Yes, it was something that cut Peter to the heart. But just a few verses earlier in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, you know what we see? Jesus preaching in the synagogue and then coming and staying at Peter's home. And that's when he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus and Peter had a relationship, a friendship. And that friendship ultimately culminated through the miraculous catch of fish in Peter's conversion and invitation to discipleship. But it happened within the context of friendship. You know, in Mark's gospel and in Matthew's gospel, the call of St. Peter is simply, it says, they're, they're, they're much more quick and to the point, it says Jesus was walking along the shore and saw Peter and called him, and Peter dropped his nets and followed him. And that's true, but we don't get the fuller context. Luke's gospel gives us the fuller context that there was a friendship and then a little bit later on, about two years later into Jesus' public ministry, is John chapter 6. And Jesus teaches about the Eucharist, about him giving himself his flesh and blood, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And the crowds are scandalized, and most of them leave. 
And then Peter turns and he looks at his disciples. He says, will you leave also? And Peter turns and looks back at Jesus and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. He doesn't say, of course we're going to stay, Jesus. We understand transubstantiation. And I'd like to explain to you how that exactly works. Peter doesn't know what, I mean, Peter is, is, his mind is blown just as much as all the others who left. Why didn't Peter leave? Because Peter had learned to trust Jesus because of their friendship. Because Jesus had come through time and time again and proven himself trustworthy. And so Peter could say, I don't get any of this. This, I'm pretty scandalized right now. But who am I going to go to, Lord? You have the words of everlasting life. I don't understand, but I trust you. And then in John chapter 21, the invitation that Jesus gives to John Simon, son of John, do you love me? It's a challenging little passage where Jesus is commissioning the threefold denial of Christ that Peter did earlier, and now Jesus is restoring him. What a tender human moment. This human moment that's built in friendship. So the second habit is authentic friendship. Again, all of us can live the universal call to holiness. All of us can live authentic friendship. And then third habit is living this little way of evangelization. Living the little way of evangelization. A quick explanation of what that is. We all know the little way of St. Therese. St. Therese is the patroness of focus. And the little way of evangelization is taking what Therese did in her life of prayer and service to do great little things with great love. We do the same thing in the work of evangelization. Little things with great love. Not many of us are called to do, for example, what JP2 did, where he preached to millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions throughout the life of his papacy. World Youth Day. I was at World Youth Day in, in Denver. I was a young man at the time. And he comes to the stadium, Mile High, Mile High City, and he preaches the gospel. He was amazing. He was extraordinarily gifted. But most of us don't have that gift. But every one of us can love just a few people around us. And the little way of evangelization is to find just a few people in your life, the friends that you're already around, and to invest deeply in them. Invest in them through authentic friendship. Pray for them, that they would be open to the Spirit's movement in their life. And for some of them, maybe it's the first time they will encounter God through your friendship. And for others, maybe it's deepening that friendship. And then to practice this win, build, send. To win them through your friendship. To then build them up in Christ and then to send them out to do the same. All of us can do that. Not many of us are called to, to do what JP2 did, but all of us can do that little way of evangelization. Uh, we like to tell our missionaries a story of Jan Taranowski. Jan Taranowski was a Polish tailor. Uh, he had tried to do uh, a, a business job, but he, he found he wasn't capable of doing it, and so he became a tailor. And he was in his 30s. This is in the, in the 1930s in Poland. And he heard a homily at Mass where the priest said, it is not difficult to become a saint. And so Jan Taranowski considers that his conversion moment. In his, in his mid-30s, he hears this homily. It is not difficult to become a saint. And he decided, I'm going to pursue holiness. I'm going to try to live my life to be a saint. He's a single man, never married, but he formed these what he called living rosary groups. He gathered men around him and formed these living rosary groups. And out of those living rosary groups, 10 men became priests in Poland. And one of those men was a man by the name of Karol Wojtyla, who later became Pope John Paul II. And Pope John Paul II would say that he would not become a priest were it not for Jan Taranowski. The only reason we know who Jan Taranowski is is because Pope John Paul II spoke about him and talked about him. Other than that, Jan Taranowski would be lost to history. Not many of us can do what JP2 did. Everybody can do what Jan Taranowski did. 
And without Jan Tiernowski, there's no Saint Pope John Paul the Great. I would argue the greatest saint we have had in the hundreds of years, certainly the greatest pope in hundreds of years. Without Jan Tiernowski, without his simple little way of evangelization where he just did little things with great love, where he loved these men in his life, just a few, we would not have Pope John Paul II. So this little way of evangelization where we're investing deeply in a few. The scripture passage that we frequently talk about with this, with this, with this, this habit of living the little way of evangelization is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It's the end of Paul's life, uh, perhaps the last letter that he wrote from prison before he was martyred. And he's writing to Timothy, and he tells Timothy, the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, teach these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul gives us a vision for how to share the faith. What you've heard from me, teach to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to others, and those others to others. I think one of the great joys that we're going to experience in heaven is getting to look back at all of the generations that preceded us, that brought us the faith. Just, I mean, just imagine how amazing it is. You're going to be able to go to your great, 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 great grandfather, who maybe was the first one to convert to the Catholic faith in, in you know, pre-Germany times in the, in the 1200s. And thank him for saying yes to Jesus, because if he didn't say yes to Jesus, maybe his children wouldn't, grandchildren wouldn't all the way down today. And it's not just going to be one. It's going to be probably thousands of people that you get to thank. And God willing, there will be people who are coming to you hundreds of years after you lived and died who are going to come and say, thank you for your commitment to Jesus Christ. Were it not for you passing it on to your children or to your friends, I wouldn't have encountered Christ myself. That's the wonderful mystery of God. And it was done person to person to person. The things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses Teach these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Just a quick story here, and then how much time do I have? My ten? Yeah, five minutes. Great, sounds good. Five minutes. So let me close with uh, just a few thoughts, and then I'll close with a story. So this, this approach of winning and building, sending the method metal to the master, and these three habits, the habits of divine intimacy, authentic friendship, and living the little way of evangelization, has borne tremendous fruit in focus, and it can bear tremendous fruit anywhere, because these are things that can be followed by anyone. Earlier, I mentioned that we have 800 missionaries. We serve on about 200 locations. Here's what's amazing about this process of the little way of evangelization. It took focus 18 years, 18 years to serve our first 100 campuses. It only took seven years for us to reach the next 100 campuses. Because there's a spiritual principle of multiplication going on. One reaches two, two reach four, four reach eight, eight, sixteen, and so on. A hundred years, sorry, 18 years to reach our first hundred, seven to reach the next hundred. <clears throat> the same thing is true with our alumni. Five years ago, we had about 20,000 alumni. Five years ago, we had about 20,000 alumni. Today, over 45,000. It's doubled in five years. Again, because of the process of multiplication. One reaches two, two reach four, et cetera. And one fruit is vocations. In the last 22 years, 1,028 men and women have made the decision to join the priesthood or religious life after their involvement with Focus on a college campus. Over 1,000. Now, that's not due to Focus. That's due to God. And that's due to the chaplain and the missionaries. It's, it's God works with all of these. But Focus was there and help these people discern this call to religious life. Again, here's what's amazing. Of the 239 women and 789 men in the last 22 years involved with Focus who've joined the priesthood of religious life, it took us 18 years for the first 600 to make that choice and five years for 400 more. It's a growing multiplication. 
It's like starting a snowball that rolls down the hill and gets bigger and bigger over time. This is how the church is supposed to work. John's going to play a voicemail for me that uh, our missionaries will probably remember. I've shared this voicemail before with our missionaries at training. This is a voicemail from a friend of mine, uh, a Catholic priest in the uh, Archdiocese of Denver. His name is Father Greg Peterson. So that voicemail was from Father Greg Peterson on February 22nd. And the reason I remember the date is because Father Greg calls me every year on the day of his conversion, which was February 22nd of 1999. And uh, I have, I, I'm grateful for him for doing that. Sometimes I intentionally ignore the call so he leaves a voicemail, <laughs> you know, so that I can listen to it later when I'm having a particularly bad day. I can listen to this voicemail from Father Greg. But I share that voicemail with you really for one reason. February 22nd, 1999 is exactly six weeks to the day when I first became a focus missionary. I became a focus missionary on January 4th of 1999. Now our missionaries have the opportunity to go to six weeks of training with, with uh, you know, where they're getting lots of great in-class in instruction from some of the best teachers in the country. I didn't have that. My first day as a focus missionary I started evangelizing on campus. My training was in Curtis Martin's uh, living room with he and his wife, Michael Ann, where they led me through a Bible study and taught me how to do these things. My wife and I were just in their living room. That's how we learned. Six weeks to the day after I became a focused missionary with no training, Father Greg has his conversion right in the middle of my Bible study. I didn't even know what happened until months later. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent of evangelization. It's the Holy Spirit who moved Greg's heart to conversion. It's the Holy Spirit who convicted Greg of his sin and convinced him of his need to repent and gave him the vision of eternal life with him. That wasn't me. That was the Holy Spirit. You know what I did? I showed up. I showed up. I prayed. I tried to develop a friendship with Greg and I showed up. And the same thing is true in a certain sense with vocations. The Holy Spirit is the one who will convict hearts to make the choice, to make the radical call to say yes to that for the priesthood and religious life. But we need to show up. But we show up as disciples who surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and allow him to work through us. So thank you again for your Support of Focus, thank you for the support of our missionaries. Really, really great to be here with you. Blessed to be on mission with you. John, every time I talk to a Focus minister on my campus, they are so engaging and they're so enthusiastic. Now you are director of development, which means you train them. Do you train enthusiasm and approachability or do you hire it? So that's my question. That's a great question. Do we train or uh, are we just lucky? Well, I, the, the ultimate answer is it comes back to what I was talking about earlier. Can you guys hear me okay? I don't know if the microphone's working. Is it working? Um, at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're gathering young people together who have encountered Jesus Christ. And when somebody encounters Jesus Christ, there's a joy that flows through them 
regardless of, of who they are. We do have an acronym in focus, faithful, available, contagious, and teachable. That's what we look for in student leaders, somebody who's faithful to Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church, somebody who makes themselves available for formation, somebody who is contagious, which simply means that they allow the love of Christ to flow through them, and teachability. They're open to being taught how to live missionary discipleship and being taught the teachings of the church. So we look for contagiousness, but contagiousness is not a, a natural virtue in a certain sense, it's a supernatural one. It's that Jesus Christ lives in and through us. Now, yes, we're gonna train our missionaries how to smile if they don't know how to smile very well and things like that, but ultimately, this comes through Christ. I'll, I'll share just one quick example of this. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, known for about five years, uh, she, she's involved with, uh, she, she knows many of the Focus staff members, and she, she uh, went through a, a recent tragedy in her life, and Focus was there for her in a, in a particular way. And at one point she said to me, John, the, the people in Focus are the best people I've ever met. They're amazing. Like, the joy and the love that comes through them is, is just, it's better than anything I've ever seen. She herself does not, is not a Christian. And I was able to tell her, what you see in the Focus missionaries is not them. It's Jesus living through them. So she thinks that we're just really cool people. <laughs> we're not. We're slobs just like everybody else in the world. But Jesus lives in and through us. That's what makes our missionaries impressive. Thank you for, for that. Uh, by the way, uh, you are between them and lunch, so that could be the reason <laughs> why. What Great to be with you all. We'll see you. <laughs> Is there any last questions? Because we'll, I'll send you on your way in a few minutes then. Okay, let's give John a wonderful round.